if you're looking at it from the perspective of, say, China, which has been a huge driver of this, that actually from they're the ones who've really done the most decoupling and deglobalization insofar as trade with the rest of the world has shrunk dramatically as a share of Chinese GDP. So if you're sitting in China, you're looking, it's like, we, we, we are already sort of withdrawing. Welcome to What the Finance. I'm What the Finance founder, Anthony Fatsis. For the first time, for many of us, it seems as if the world is moving further apart rather than closer together. From the Brexit vote to Trump trade wars with China, coronavirus pandemic, the Russian conflict, and continued tensions with China, it feels as if the world is being fractured into two and further towards protectionism rather than openness. I look forward to speaking further about this phenomenon with our guest today and unearthing the impacts of this on the markets. Uh, so today we speak with Matthew Klein. Matthew is the founder uh, of The Overshoot and co-author of the book, Trade Wars and uh, Class Wars, How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace. So Matthew, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. Thanks very much for having me. No problem. So I guess my first question before we go into uh, trade wars, sort of what are your thoughts on uh, the current markets and what we're really experiencing at the moment? Well, I mean, one thing that's interesting, if you just look year to date, is the extent to which we've seen this huge rebound in optimism, particularly whether it's sort of growth sensitive tech stocks or certain kinds of crypto related assets or certain commodities, whatever. It's been a huge shift in sentiment and pricing. Um, you've also seen interest rates going down a lot of, or longer term interest rates going down, even as um, various central banks are continuing to, to tighten policy. And so that's the really interesting dynamic of why is this happening now? Was it just you know, people sort of overstretched the end of last year. Now it's a fresh start. I'm going to put put some risk back on. I don't know, uh, but it's definitely interesting to be watching this. Um, you know, the extent that central bankers are trying to tighten financial conditions and financial conditions are rapidly loosening by a lot of these measures. That's that's sort of an interesting dynamic. I'm interested to see how that plays out. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of where we are. I mean, I guess the one sort of fundamental thing that's changed sort of the end of last year um, is the Chinese reopening, the abandonment of, of zero COVID and the extent that we've been seeing that, um, you know, I mean, that explains why industrial metals, I think, have rallied to the extent they have and, and oil um, to a certain extent. But, you know, is that, I don't think it's everything. I think there's more going on than just that. So it's, it's an interesting puzzle to watch, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess if most people thought with China, I guess once it opening, there'd be a massive increase in demand. And, you know, as you said, there's in, in sort of metals for oil for a bit, but it's sort of come back down. So I guess maybe it hasn't been as uh, as large as a lot of people are expecting. Yeah, I think part of it is that they're still working through the fact that a lot of people are getting sick. A lot of people are nervous about getting sick. A lot of people are dying. We don't really know what the numbers are there. And the health system is not necessarily handling it as well as it, as it could, especially outside of tier one cities like Beijing and Shanghai and, and Guangzhou. So I would imagine that maybe three, six months from now, it'll look different, but I think that's probably part of the issue that we're seeing. Yeah, definitely. So I guess from your perspective, what are the key uh, drivers of what, what we're experiencing at the moment? Do you think it's more that the uh, people think that uh, Pal is done with, with tightening as, as aggressively as he has and sort of starting to slow down and I go that way, I guess, due to disinflation, or do you think there's sort of other factors that could be uh, influencing this? Yeah, I think that's definitely a big explanation there. I mean, the big question we've had really at this point for two years is to what extent is this post, you know, the pandemic reopening going to lead to changes in trend growth and changes in inflation? That's been the question since the beginning of 2021. And initially we were in one point of view, which was it's going to be great for growth. Um, you know, the forecast was saying that the U.S. economy in particular was going to be better off by now or next year than it would have been under pre-pandemic forecasts, while the impact on inflation would essentially be zero. Now, obviously, we've come a long way in the past two years, but I think we're sort of we, we may have passed sort of the peak pessimism where people were thinking, oh, well, this is going to be terrible for trend growth. Um, and also, we're going to have this really sustained inflation cost. I think now maybe. I mean, sort of looking at the market action, telling me what it is, but maybe the view is, well, maybe we overdid it a little bit on this, that actually there's going to be more disinflation happening without any kind of growth cost, without any kind of cost in terms of unemployment or for the perspective of stock prices, you know, profits and sales. And so that's going to need naturally lead to sort of a, a reassessment of, of relative pricing there. I, I mean, I don't know if that's right. I mean, maybe, you know, people were wrong before or right now, maybe they're right before wrong now, but that, I think that's probably kind of the big, big driver at that sort of high level. Yeah. And do you think the key, obviously, you mentioned employment there, which I guess, or unemployment, which was uh, something that 
Bell is really closely watching. The fact that we haven't really experienced any that that bigger change in that number, do you think is that that's allowed it to get this far and potentially for a safe landing? Maybe. Well, it really depends on your point of view because. Uh, I mean, this is not just true in the US, this is true across the major economies. So European unemployment rates are multi-decade lows. I think in Australia, you know, the employment population row is basically an all-time, employment population ratio is like an all-time high. I mean, this is, we're seeing this across economies and, and including ones that did different kind of policy mixes in the United States. I think from the perspective of the Fed, it's an interesting question because on the one hand, a lot of their models say we need unemployment to go up in order to bring um, wage growth to a slower pace, and then that's going to feed through to slower inflation. And so from that perspective, the fact that the job market has been as resilient as it has been is actually a problem for them. The alternative point of view, of course, is that you don't need this to happen. And in fact, Powell said that he was gratified that so far we've managed to see a fair amount of slowdown in inflation without any kind of cost to the labor market. And so just because that's what the models say, I don't think that's what he personally wants. I think a lot of other officials probably don't want that. If they, I'm sure they would prefer a world where inflation just goes away without any kind of labor market costs. So there's a tension there between what the forecast might be saying internally and what the implications are for you know what they want the job market to do versus you know being normal people looking at this. And obviously, it'd be nicer if we didn't have to have millions of people lose their jobs for inflation to get back in line. I mean, that that's always a very unpleasant trade off, and no one wants to make that choice. So it, I, I, you know how we interpret this. You know, for the growth outlook, it's a little tough to say, but I mean, I think I think it flows through to why stocks and, and risk assets are are positive, because if the view is we don't need to have a cost to growth, then all those companies that were very geared towards growth can continue to make money. Um, and there's no there's no trade off there. So that's obviously really good for them. But, you know, who's going to be right or wrong? That's that's obviously the real, real question. But we'll, it'll take a little while to find out. Yeah, it seems like the people who've been wrong have been the ones who go for the extremes, I guess you could say, you know, 2011, 2020. Uh, sorry, 2021, 2022, it was more like, you know, growth, you know, COVID's changed everything. It's got growth all the way. And then I guess the, the back end of 2022 was sort of the opposite way. It's like, oh, everything's collapsing, the world's fractioning, all this stuff. But now it's, you know, you could potentially say it's, yeah, it, it's going the other way again. So from your perspective, if we go to that second point about how there's like, a, I guess, deglobalization, there's going to be uh reonshoring or, or friendshoring and all those factors. Do you see that as a trend that, is potentially going to continue or do you think there was maybe too much emphasis put on it by uh, maybe not fear mongers, but by uh, those sort of people? Well, so far it's one of those things that we haven't actually, there's been a lot of talk about it and it might happen, but so far we haven't actually seen it yet. Um, and that's where I think, you know, it's interesting. Obviously if it does happen, that would be a big deal if it happens in a meaningful way, but it's not something we've seen. I mean, there, there are no data that indicate that we're actually moving in that, in that direction yet. I mean, maybe that'll change, but um, I think if you sort of take the longer view it's funny, I was actually giving a presentation not that long ago on this very question. So it's fresh in my mind. If you take the longer view, um, globalization or global inter economic and financial integration really peaked around 2008. And since then, if you just zoom out at kind of a high level, what you see is a trend line up towards 2008 of increasing integration. And then it basically stops. It doesn't go down. Um, it just stays flat. I mean, if you look at sort of the financial integration only, you actually do see it going down. There's much more of a financial fragmentation post 2008 than an economic one. But but trade is a share of GDP, for example, basically for global GDP, basically flat from 2008 onwards. Tiny bit lower now actually than that. But you know, basically there's no trend. But that high level view really masks a lot of different perspectives for individual economic blocks or jurisdictions. So if you're looking at it from the perspective of say China which has been a huge driver of this, that actually from they're the ones who've really done the most decoupling and deglobalization insofar as trade with the rest of the world has shrunk dramatically as a share of Chinese GDP. So if you're sitting in China, you're looking, you're like, we, we, we are already sort of withdrawing. And you can argue about why that happened. I think a lot of those reasons are perfectly normal or whatever, for, done for sort of internal you know, domestic points rather than some sort of global grand strategy. But regardless, that's where you see. So trade exports plus imports as a share of Chinese GDP went from about 65% to you know 35%. That's an enormous change. It's also completely unlike what you've seen almost anywhere else in the rest of the world during that time, except in uh, the Middle East and Africa, which happened to be major commodity exporters that happened to be very geared towards China. So they said that China was cutting back or Chinese investment in both in infrastructure and in property slowed down very dramatically from sort of 2010 onwards. You expect those countries to be really on the receiving end. And again, like you actually see that connection, but everywhere else you don't see that. Either it's sort of flat or it's going up, integration is rising. The other thing you see that's interesting is that even though 
China's exposure to the rest of the world from China's perspective fell very dramatically. From the rest of the world's perspective, their exposure to China went up. And the reason is essentially if Chinese GDP as a share of the global economy goes from about 6% in 2007 to around 18% now, even if trade as a share of Chinese GDP falls, trade with China with the rest of the world is going to go up from their perspective. That's just sort of the, you know how the, how the math works there. So everyone else is thinking they are becoming much more tightly coupled with China, where China's thinking we're not. And so it's an interesting, that asymmetry, I think, is very interesting. And thinking about sort of the geopolitical implications of that is also very interesting. So when people talk about, oh, you know, we're going to do all this stuff, uh, uh, you know, move out of China, we're going to use the government power. I mean, maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. There's a lot of ways of looking at it, but I think it's really as sort of a, a starting point to say what's already happened and say, well, from from one important perspective, this has already happened from the Chinese perspective of them saying, okay, we're already, you know, becoming much less reliant on imports for a lot of our domestic needs and much less reliant on imports for that matter as inputs to our own exports. And so, you know, if they said the rest of the world is catching up to what China had been doing for the past 15 years, that's an interesting phenomenon, but I don't think it's necessarily a sign of some, you know, deep new fracture that pre-exists what's been going on for 15 plus years. Yeah, it's really interesting. So you're just saying it's the, I guess it's just the fact that China has grown to such a large economy that, you know, obviously they're not at the point of the US or other Western countries where they're very, uh, as sort of um, consumption driven as uh, as them, but there are still, it's, it's increasing just because of the massive size of their economy. And I guess you could link that to potentially the retail uh, uh, properties within uh, China as well. Maybe that's where that demand came from. Or is there any other factors? Well- what I think is interesting is that they haven't become more consumption oriented. So okay. that's kind of the funny puzzle here is that one might have thought that would be the corollary here. Um, it's what I think a lot of external observers would have been rooting for if they if they'd seen if you'd seen what happened with you know the Chinese exports as a share of GDP by itself, for example, and you knew that China had grown, you're like, oh great, you know all the rebalancing, the stuff, the stuff that we've been talking about in 2005, six, seven, they they fixed it, but that's not what happened. The main thing that happened, well, first of all, China's growth rate overall slowed down very dramatically. And it basically slowed down. So on the one hand, export markets just were not going to be a source of growth for China to the extent they were because their main export markets just got hammered after the financial crisis and the growth trends were just much lower in the US and Europe. So that's part of it. The other thing is that China's initial response was to boost domestic investment, not so much domestic consumption, but investment, whether it's infrastructure projects or other kind of building things, um, residential property. But then after a couple of years, so by 2011, they realize this is not working out for them. And, and there are all these changes there in terms of changes on, on leverage and, and other things and restrictions on on uh, borrowing and investment. And that's, I think, a big part of the reason why your imports fell, because you don't need as much copper and iron ore and coal and all that um, if you're building less, fewer things. I mean, it's not like it went to zero, but the growth rate went from, you know, 25, 30% a year. This is, again, based on just China's official statistics to, you know, five, six, 7% a year by 2019. So that's a huge slowdown. And I think that that explains part of the drop in imports. And again, if you're importing less, you don't need to export as much to pay for that. So that's part of it. Um, you know, the one thing that is interesting, though, is if we're looking at the difference between exports and imports, that's where China actually has not seen the same kind of rebalance that one might have expected, especially if we're looking just the past couple of years. So relative to the Chinese economy, the trade surplus was about 10% of GDP around 2007, eight when it peaked. It hasn't yet hit that again. But over the past couple of years, it has increased dramatically. Uh, And in fact, the increase in the trade surplus has been a major source of overall growth in the Chinese economy because domestic demand has been so weak with COVID restrictions. And it's actually very striking that the trade surplus had been, people thought it was kind of shrinking or maybe it was going away before the pandemic. And it came back very dramatically. In fact, it was probably the biggest, one of the biggest growth impulses they've had over the past three years. And so to the extent that that you know, remains the case. It actually means that for all that trade as a share of GDP, maybe doesn't look that important for China now compared to 15 years ago. In a certain sense, the sensitivity of the trade balance and the and the ability uh, of the Chinese economy to use the trade surplus or the change in the trade balance to compensate for domestic weakness is just as big now as it was in the past. And in fact, that actually is, I think, also suggestive of maybe they haven't even become delinked either, uh, despite what some of the data will show you. And I think that's that's also an interesting phenomenon there in terms of their reliance on external demand. You know, what that means in the future. I mean, another thing that's kind of funny, just on this decoupling thing, if you look just at the bilateral data, so you look at like US imports from China, that peaked in 2018 in dollar terms. So you might naively think, oh, tariffs worked. 
We don't import as much from China anymore. But if you look at the U.S. trade balance with the rest of the world, you know, not you're agnostic about what countries it comes from. And then you look at China's trade balance with the rest of the world, again, agnostic about what country it comes from. Those two thing numbers move together remarkably well, especially since the start of the pandemic. Um, there, there, that was true before the global financial crisis. It was less true in the period sort of from 2008 to 2019 or so, partly because of changes in the oil balance and difference in, you know, a lot of changes in both countries. But then from 2020 onwards, it's like a perfect straight line of, of, of link between the increase in China's trade surplus and the increase in China in the U.S. trade deficit. And so what that tells me is, you know, if you're forgetting for a moment about like the legal particularities of where you say a particular import comes from or goes, I mean, these are still two economies that are very, from this perspective, remarkably connected, despite what anyone else says in terms of their relationship with each other. Yes, yeah, that's really interesting. So you, you know, we were talking about, I guess, consumption within China. Is that really just a currency uh, issue? The fact that you could say that maybe their currency should be stronger because of how because of their exports, but there's uh, sort of limitations there. That's probably part of it. I mean, there's a, so, you know, the currency is one of the, the several things that can affect the balance between consumption, production, you know, that that sort of thing, that mix there or, or between, you know, spending and saving. And it definitely was the case, I think very clearly the case before, at least until 2010, um, that, the Chinese government was using an undervalued exchange rate as one of the tools at their disposal to transfer spending power from consumers towards um, various preferred entities, including exporters. Exporters, including not just Chinese ex- Chinese owned exporters, but also foreign owned exporters based in China. Now, more recently, it's not as obvious in the sense that the official foreign reserves of the People's Bank of China have not they peaked in I think 2013 or something like that. And they've been, you know, they dropped a bit, you know, from then to 2016 and sort of stayed flat. Actually started ticking up again a little bit recently, but you know, very small. But I don't think that's necessarily the comprehensive view. You have to look at it. You know, the, the Chinese political economy is different than ours. So, you know, the central bank does one thing, but they're also all the big banks are effectively run by the government or the party, but they all, you know, so they'll, they'll follow instructions if you tell them to do something. And there were certain uneconomic or seemingly uneconomic positions they were taking in the past couple of years of heavily investing in foreign currency assets at a time when yields in China were substantially higher than yields abroad. It's not the case anymore, by the way, but it was the case at the time. And so if you added that up to the official um, foreign currency uh, reserves of the People's Bank of China, it gets sort of a different picture of there was still intervening. So I think that's part of it. Um, but it's not the only thing. I mean, one thing that historically has been the case is the fact, I mean, it's not it's not true now. They did some reforms, I guess, in like 2014, I think, but historically been the case that if you're a regular person in China, you have savings. The only place you could put it really was in a bank account. And those bank accounts would yield basically nothing. And those banks would then lend to preferred borrowers at rates that were not zero, but were relatively low compared to the growth rate in, in the Chinese economy. And that worked out great for the banks because they got a nice spread. And it worked out great for the borrowers because they basically were able to borrow well below whatever reasonable cost of capital. But it was terrible for the depositors. So there's a huge transfer from ordinary people trying to save something to to you know the businesses and local governments that were getting this money. That's changed somewhat since then. Um, it's not fully fixed, but it, it, that, that, that has reformed. Um, there's also, I mean, another big thing that, again, there's been some progress on, but, but still not really enough, is uh, China's tax system is very much skewed towards taxing consumer spending and not taxing income or, for that matter, business profits. And there's no there's no property tax in China. Uh, the income tax is minimal, and it basically means that if, you, in fact, the people at the upper end of the income distribution pay much lower effective tax rates than other, a lot of other people. Um so, but there's very high consumption taxes. It's not, a, I mean, and the overall tax take is actually quite low. So that's an example of something that you see. There are lots of things you can point to. You can look at the way environmental regulations are disproportionately favor certain kinds of businesses at the expense of consumers and not just consumers, just people who then have to deal with the costs on their own health and well-being, which is particularly problematic because it's not as if the healthcare coverage in China is so great or the retirement security is that great. So there are lots of things like this that combine to reduce the consumer spending power of people in China. And that's why the consumption share of China's economic output is so low. So in most countries, it's a range, but 
you know, you think about everything that's produced in an economy, somewhere between say like 60 to 75% of that or so, maybe 60 to 70 is goes to consumer spending or is consumed by households. It's like what they want. Some of it's, some of it's the government does things. Some of it's, you know, home building, that's the other parts, right. But some of it's exported or whatever, but you know, in China, we're talking less than 40%. That's a huge gap. And that I think is a function of its very unusual political economy. The only other places you can find in the world that have a consumption share of GDP that low are either tax havens. So places like, you know, Cayman Islands or Ireland or things like that, or um, sort of very small oil exporters when oil prices are very high. But these are very unusual situations. That's not at all analogous to China, which is a large diversified, basically continental sized economy. And so, um, yeah, it's it's reflective of these very deep political economy problems they have um, and imbalances. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I guess if we go to uh, so, sort of the book and that you're the co-author of, uh, in the title specifically, uh, you sort of, it mentions how rising inequality distorts the global economy. So I guess what has influenced this inequality? Yeah, so I mean, actually a lot of what I was just telling you is, is in the book, um, it relates to that. Uh, so yeah, I think the first part of just thinking about, you know, when we talk about inequality, it's it's there are lots of ways people talk about it. I think the sort of simplest one is just how is spending power, how accessible is spending power to people, and you know, how distributed is that among different people and different types of people? Because it, you know the sort of very basic, the, the argument sounds kind of weird, but it's it's it rests on some very simple propositions. Um, one of which is that you know we have seen the concentration of income gone up. That's an empirical fact. Another empirical thing we've observed across society is that people who have much higher income, so like not everyone, but like at the very top anyway, the income distribution, you're not going to spend a lot of what you earn on goods and services because there's only so much you can you can buy. And the rest of it's going to go into buying assets. It might be trophy properties or more like what's going to be like stocks and bonds, things like that. For everyone else, for the vast majority of people, if you get money, you're going to spend it sooner or later, you know, right away. But like before you die, like that's, that, that's going to be how it goes. Whereas, you know, for you know, small sort of segment of the population. That's not how it works. And we've seen an increase in uh, inequality. And then the other point is that if someone is buying financial assets and not buying goods and services, that only works if someone else is issuing financial assets. Um, and the flip side, you know, since all income comes from buying goods and services at the end of the day, if someone is not buying goods and services and buying financial assets, that means other people are buying goods and services who are not necessarily having the income to do that. And they're issuing financial assets somehow, the, whether, whoever that is. So maybe the government is running budget deficits to pay for welfare or whatever. I mean, that's one possibility, right? Or you have like consumers taking out a bunch of debt out of their houses to, to buy things, whatever. That That's the kind of thing that we see. And basically, if you look at the history of the global economy, particularly since 1989, we've seen this huge a couple of big changes uh, that led to income concentration across the major economies. It was most enough of them to make a real difference here. And that led to these big uh, increases in both borrowing and saving. Um, so the saving by the people who have a lot of extra money and borrowing sort of necessity, you know, it has to be that way, you know, the, the counterpart to that extra saving. And that, that made things very unstable. Um, it meant that we had debt bubbles that eventually burst. It also meant that to the extent that you didn't have enough borrowing and lending, um, that you just had an overall reduction in in total purchases of goods and services and a weakness in income growth. And that was also very disruptive. And so, you know, we say trade wars are class wars. It's that we think about trade economic conflicts between countries like, oh, the Chinese took our jobs or whatever, or, you know, in the European context, you can say, oh, those, those damn Germans, you know, screwing us over, or alternatively, those lazy, you know, Spaniards are taking all our money. All of those things are wrong. And they're, they're wrong in a very important way, which is that it's nothing to do with what country you're in. It is all about where you are, like what is your economic role within your society? That that basically the vast majority of people across countries actually are in a very similar uh, economic situation, at least in terms of how well they've been doing and, and who has been benefiting at their expense. And that, um, you know, th thinking about it in terms of country versus country is, is profoundly misleading. And that's really the the core argument of the book, and and it relates. And I think if you if you take the time to go through it, and I confess that it's not straightforward, but that's why it's book length as an argument. Um, it explains a lot, and I think it clarifies a lot of things that have happened over the past thirty plus years. Yeah, it's interesting because I guess a lot of people would probably say that maybe uh, a lot of this inequality has occurred 
you know, after we've experienced globalization, you could say from, you know, mid mid seventies to where we are today, that there has been that sort of the increase in, in the inequality. So is that, would you, you mentioned there, I guess the liberalization of financial finance in general, would you say that's more what's influenced that rather than maybe the actual globalization itself? And well, I think it's, trade, yeah. so I, it definitely coincided with globalization, but I think it's important to, to note, which we do, that globalization itself is not what caused the increase in inequality. And the problem that we have is that it's the way we chose to globalize increased inequality. And in fact, took it, or put another way, a lot of the important actors across these different societies used globalization or took advantage of greater economic openness and economic integration to increase inequality in their own societies and take advantage of the opportunity that presented. So it's not that globalization inherently would have led to inequality or the globalization would have inherently been economically destabilizing. It's more that the way that it happened to go, that we happened to go about it. And in fact, basically you can, one way of reading our book is essentially an argument of it didn't have to be this way. We could do a different way. And like, it's not that globalization is a problem. It's just that it it's neither good nor bad, right? It's just, it just is. And we can make it work a lot better if we do these things differently than what we did. But because of how things went, you know, it, basically we sort of had the bad, we got the bad version of globalization, but it didn't have to go that way. And that's really, I think, an important point to, to recognize here that it did coincide with globalization and globalization was, you know, trade and finance across borders basically transmitted some problems from one society to another. That's a key point of the book. You have an increase in inequality in one side that creates a lot of problems for that society. Some of those problems spill over to other societies through trade and financial channels. But that doesn't mean that trade and financial linkages are inherently bad. It just means that the problems in that society that then spilled over are bad. You know, you, you don't want to destroy the whole system just because someone else made a, a mistake, essentially. And that, I think that's really an important point as well. So with those, I guess, uh, problems that were um, or, or the bad bad decisions or uh, that, that impacted that, were they mainly, I guess, due to sort of corporations and I guess them focusing on their own um, specific, I guess, interests or, or what were those? Well, this is where it gets complicated and it really yeah. depends. You have to look kind of at the specific histories of the different economies and, and, you know, there's a mix of ideology and sort of particular domestic political circumstances. There's a lot of things that have to do with, you know, challenges of managing economic development or, you know, trying to converge with rich societies and you know, certain kinds of development models or just your own political domestic priorities. I mean, it really, as I said, it really depends. I mean, that's why, you know, you've, you've, you've read the book, uh, or it sounds like you've read the book. And I mean, like the whole second half is basically kind of doing these detailed analyses of the major three major economies, namely the U S Europe and China, and really trying to get into what actually happened and why, because the story in every place is different. Um, it just, you know, that's, I mean, I think one of the other big takeaways here is that history is contingent. This was not inevitable. You know, just as I said, that globalization was not inherent, inherently bad. It just turned out that way for a specific set of reasons. It's very helpful to know what the reasons were. And so that's kind of what we're going into. So there, you can look at the history of, of, you know, what happened in China, particularly after 1989, but also leading up to that and that, how that played out or what happened with Germany after reunification and how did that redound to the rest of Europe or what happened in the United States and, you know, why is it that the United States and Germany had in many ways very similar paths internally and yet had very different outcomes externally? You know, that's a lot of what we spent the book talking about. So yeah, it was all contingent and there's not one single explanation. The things you mentioned definitely were factors, but it really depends on, on where you are and sort of when exactly you're looking. Yeah, definitely. So I guess if we look at the US today uh, and where it is today, is there any ways that I guess reducing those barriers could reduce inequality or is there any other factors that you think need to change to potentially be move in the right direction? I know it's probably a very complex <laughs> question. Yeah. To ask. It's very I mean, it is, it, there are a lot of things that, you know, we could suggest. I think one thing that is interesting at a very high level is if you look at what we wrote in the book about what we wanted the U S to do um, a bunch of those things have sort of happened uh, and not because necessarily we wrote the book, but just, you know, the pandemic response ended up in some important ways leading to a change in direction. It hasn't been, I would say, necessarily enough, but it's definitely directionally correct. And I mean, even some of the stuff in Europe too. I mean, it's, you know, again, it's sort of one of these two related tell kind of things, but there's been a huge change in Europe with the pandemic and then with the war uh, in Ukraine. 
you're seeing changes in the way European policymaking is is happening and you know people's perspectives on what is appropriate and what's not appropriate. And I think that's also moving in a direction that could potentially be very positive and at least using our, our framework. So I I you know I don't know I wouldn't say you know we've won the argument or anything like that, but I mean I, I definitely think it's it's not getting worse, uh, which is which is good. Um, I mean there's still definitely big issues to tackle. I wouldn't say things are fixed, but I think there's directionally. I mean the, the focus on you know the fact that for example in the U.S. the pandemic response is so heavily weighted towards supporting people on lower incomes to help them spend money, which that that worked, or the fact that we're now seeing this push for more. Um, you know, what I would call and not a zero sum approach to investment of, you know, I know some people in Europe disagree, but you look at the Inflation Reduction Act and it's basically, I think it's, you know, we need to build a lot more stuff because we need, we, we need this, you know, globally, we need to have a lot more, you know, green technology, that kind of thing. We're going to spend a bunch of money to make it happen. And by the way, some of it would be nice if it ended up in the United States because we don't want all the leak abroad, but we're not, you know, preventing anyone else from selling things here. I think that's a reasonable approach, right? I mean, the, the, the sort of counter is if you didn't do it that way, then you then all the money would go somewhere else. And that's not a problem that it goes somewhere else, but if it goes places where then other people there don't have the ability to spend it, then it basically kind of disappears down a black hole, um, which would be a problem, right? I mean, if everyone had the same kind of consuming spending balance that you have in the United States, that wouldn't matter. But if, you know, since, since those balances are not the same everywhere, it's important to kind of retain a little bit. Uh, make sure that some of it stays in your own country. That's fine. I think the fact the European response seems to be coalescing around, okay, fine, we'll do this too. I mean, that's great. Um, again, like in terms of the overall quantity is how we're going to, you know, the, the labor share has not actually increased in the United States. I don't think it's increased in Europe either um, or China or any of these places yet. Um, so, you know, we have seen an increase in, in real incomes for people in the lower end of the distribution, at least here. Um, but you know, on the sort of big picture level, we haven't we had, it's not like we've, we've seen like a really big change of the kind that we'd be talking about as being healthy, but you know, things are, as I said, in the directionally correct. So hopefully that will continue. Yeah, it's interesting. So I guess, as you said, during COVID, lots of fiscal support, especially for lower income uh, families who are struggling during that period. And then are you thinking that, and, and this is something that um, I'm not sure, I think Russell Navy has mentioned that there's going to be a lot more targeted investment uh, f- from governments and it could, that could be through grants as we've seen in the, uh, the deal you're mentioning. It could be through maybe uh, government backed loans f- through banks or something like that, where they can actually then decide where that CapEx is going to go. And then from there, potentially kickstart certain industries. So semiconductor, green investment, all that's factors. So you think that's sort of going to be, going to be the direction of uh what would potentially reduce this inequality? Well, I don't know if directed investment will itself reduce inequality. Like you have to, there are a bunch of other pieces that you would need yeah. and like by itself, actually. I mean, quite frankly, government backed loans for investment is the kind of thing that you've seen a lot in China and that's not reduced inequality at all. So like by itself, I think that, that is, that's sort of unrelated. Um, but I think, you know, it's nevertheless, I, I do think we're probably going to see more of that. I think that there's at least in, it seems like there's sort of a growing non-ideological consensus in favor of this stuff from people and politicians on both the right and the left um the combination of covid and the greater recognition of you know needing to do something about climate change and the war and generalized security fears i think creating an interesting policy environment and and that sort of this new consensus i don't i think it's sort of totally separate to be honest in the question of inequality because as like you, you can very easily have an industrial policy that is very bad for workers in fact arguably many industrial policies are bad for workers um, or consumers. Um, it really depends on the details of implementation. So that that would be, yeah, that's my view. Yeah. Okay. So then what was, so I guess moving in the right direction, you've mentioned a few things. Is that like furthermore, like late labor laws or what else do you think? would? You yeah. So, change? so one thing is just the, the amount of fiscal spending relative to what you're taking away in taxes. So for example, if you're, if you're doing a lot of spending on investments, but then you're more than covering it through taxes on consume, you know, consumption, then you know, on the one hand, you're subsidizing investment, but the net, you know, so the macro picture on a high level is, is not, you know, conducive to more consumption. So it's, that balance is important to strike. Um, what are you, what is the policy in terms of things like labor standards, for example, or wages? Uh, that's part of it too. Um, so there are a bunch of, you know, specifics you could, you could point to in terms of what the mechanics are. I, I mean, if I said at the, at, the, at the very high level, if you're looking at the US and Europe, not China, but the US and Europe, you can say, okay, there's been this big shortfall of investment of all types, public, private, whatever, residential over the past 
15, 20 years, depending on your point of view, 30 years, depending on where you're talking. So the extent that we kick that up a gear and we do that without squeezing consumers, which is an important point, that should be very growth positive and also help reduce inequality. But there are a couple of, cap- but, you know, there's a couple of conditions for that to be met. So I'm not sure yet that either the quantities we're talking about are yet going to really move the needle. And you have to make sure that you're not doing it at the expense of consumption because promoting public investment, at the expense of consumer spending is a, I mean, that's not going to help for inequality necessarily at all. I mean, as I said, that's, the, that's a very, that's what China's done. I mean, essentially what Stalin did. I mean, if you take it sort of really literally, I mean, that's not, that that is not necessarily going to improve living standards. It's really about the mix. And I think, again, like I think policymakers in Europe and the US are thinking about this in general the right way. I'm just not sure we've actually seen it. You have to wait for the implementation to see it really happen. Yeah, it's going to be a challenge. So Matthew, thank you, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. So I guess my yeah. uh, last question is, what is one message you'd like people to take away from that conversation? Oh, man. Uh, well, first of all, uh, check out Trade Wars or Class Wars. Uh, I think you'll find it. If you found this interesting, you'll find that interesting. And uh, prosperity is not zero sum. We can all do better uh, globally. We don't have to view one country's success as coming at the cost of someone else because it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, that's a great message. So thank you so much. Uh, You've mentioned the book. Is there anywhere else that people people could find you at? Oh yeah, of course. The Overshoot, uh, theovershoot.co. That is my subscription uh, research service newsletter, what have you. So you can find sort of more real-time updates on what's going on in the global economy there. So, and, uh, and, I should also note, uh, Michael Pettis, my co-author on Trade Wars or Class Wars, and I have a monthly uh, podcast that's called Unbalanced, which is covering you know the global economy. So check that out as well, unbalanced.unbalancedpod.co. Perfect. I'll put that at all in the description below. So if anyone wants to find that again. So uh, Matthew, thanks again for your time. Great. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.